Good afternoon and welcome along to the latest instalment in our In The Know series. Uh, today we are going to be focusing on developments in contract law and practice from 2020, uh, a year in which everything has changed so dramatically for all of us uh, and contract law is no exception to that. Uh, we are delighted to have so many of you uh, participating in this webinar. Um, I think we have over 275 uh, participants registered to attend, uh, far more than our auditorium in Snow Hill could ever have accommodated. So um, thank you in very much for the levels of interest uh, in this session. Um, a quick introduction on your speakers today. Uh, my name is Richard Brown. Uh, I'm joined by Ben Chivers and Rowan Armstrong, and we're all members of the Travis Smith Commercial IP and Tech team. To kick off um, what we're going to cover this afternoon, I'm first going to give an overview of the new rule changes uh, on insolvency and termination of supply contracts and what it means for suppliers. Rowan is then going to cover COVID-19 and force majeure, a topic that has even reached uh, Lionel Messi's uh, reported attempts to extricate himself from Barcelona. Um, and then Ben is going to be uh, following up with Brexit and key contract points to look out for ahead of the transition uh, period end date at the end of this year. Uh, we are very conscious that those three topics, insolvency, COVID-19 and Brexit, are not the happiest uh, of hat-trick of uh, topics, uh, but we do hope this session will provide you with some helpful guidance in uh, helping your ability to navigate your businesses through the next six months and beyond. In terms of questions, um, we've received a number of questions already ahead of this webinar, for which many thanks and which we are reflecting in the contents of the presentation. Uh, you also have an ability to ask questions um, through the platform that you're on at the moment, and please feel free to do so, and we will come back to you uh, in due course after the session with our responses to those questions. So, kicking off on termination of supply contracts uh, on insolvency. Um, I wanted to explain uh, the new changes that have come in this summer uh, to this area and uh, what they mean for suppliers uh, and indeed uh, supply contracts generally. In terms of uh, where this new piece of legislation came in from, um, there were a number of consultations uh, undertaken in 2018 uh, into insolvency law where there was a perception and probably a reality that we were falling behind some other jurisdictions. That was then delayed, as with everything, because of Brexit back in 2018. Uh, but then with the onset of the pandemic, um, it came back into much sharper focus um, with the number of businesses that were suffering and uh, the accelerated need for implementation of reform into insolvency law. What that meant was a raft of temporary measures that came in this summer. Uh, many of you be aware of, uh, for example, uh, there's now a safe harbour for directors from wrongful trading uh, offences uh, if the financial worsening of a company's position is down to COVID-19. That runs through to the end of September. Secondly, uh, your accreditors can no longer uh, petition until the end of uh, September for a winding up order unless it can be shown that COVID-19 had no material impact on a uh, financial condition of a company. But what we want to talk about today was one of the permanent measures that have come in, uh, and that is around restricting the ability of suppliers to terminate uh, contracts, supply contracts, when their customers uh, undergo uh, an insolvency procedure. And the rationale for bringing that in this summer was because of the number of businesses that have been suffering and the fact that suppliers can undermine rescue attempts um, if suppliers threaten to cease supply and, and uh, in return for um, arrears of, of payment, for example. In terms of when these changes came in, uh, they came in from the 26th of June uh, of this year, and to be uh, bring your dog to work day. Um, that seems to be every day of the week for any sort of dog at the moment, but it uh, is something that applies to all existing contracts from that date and all contracts going forward. In terms of what it affects, uh, it affects what's known as ipso facto clauses. Now, I do apologise for using any Latin in a, a webinar, but stick with it. Ipso facto clauses, otherwise known as bankruptcy clauses, are those clauses that um, allow a party to a contract to terminate that contract or do any other thing um, when the counterparty uh, 
uh, has become insolvent. Uh, in the US, those types of clauses have been ineffective since the 1980s. And as a number of you will be aware, you know, we this summer have also um, had a specific regime in the form of essential supplies. Uh, again, prevents essential suppliers of uh, services such communications and IT from being able to terminate supply contracts when the customer has undergone a CVA or administration and only allows them to terminate if unpaid charges have not been paid for 28 days once they, the customer has gone into one of those processes, but a specific regime if you like. Now what has changed um, from the 26th of June? Well, that type of regime that hitherto applied only to uh, essential supplies now applies to all suppliers of goods and services, uh, but not to customers. So this is only a, a sort of uh, anti-supplier regime, if you like, um, and would not apply to licensors of IP. So any suppliers of goods and services. And, and the two key changes that have come around uh, through this new piece of legislation under the um, Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act are, first of all, that a supplier cannot terminate or do any other thing uh, which applies on an, uh, an insolvency or a formal restructuring procedure being started uh, in respect of a customer. Uh, what that means is um, if a customer has undergone some formal insolvency procedure, so that can be a moratorium, an administration, a CVA, liquidation, those types of formal process, as soon as that's happened, the supplier's right to terminate because of that event uh, fall away. The second point is that any payment uh, or other breaches that have arisen before that insolvency procedure begins, uh, again, fall away. The, the, the slate is wiped clean. Uh, so if there are arrears of payment, uh, they will no longer uh, be actionable by uh, dint of exercising contractual rights. Um, the question therefore is, you know, can these clauses be relied upon again? Well, uh, the short answer to that is yes, they still can in certain very limited scenarios. So first of all, if the customer agrees that they can be relied upon or an office holder agrees, uh, an office holder for these purposes would likely be an insolvency practitioner. So they feel actually, yes, there's no harm in that supply contract being terminated. Uh, and secondly, there's a new process which allows suppliers to terminate, uh, still to, to apply to the court on the grounds of undue hardship to allow it to terminate. Now, uh, what does undue hardship mean uh, in this context? I think it's really where the supplier's own solvency is at risk, so a pretty high bar. There is some debate as to whether that bar should be lower, um, but as Rowan will go on to talk about, um, any attempts, I think, to use COVID-19 as a excuse, if you like, to get out of a contract may be taken um, a dim view may be taken of that by the courts. In terms of any carve-outs um, from uh, the regime, are, are there any exclusions? Well, there is obviously the, the essential supplies regime, which continues to apply, as I've explained, uh, that will continue to apply to those types of supplier. Um, financial services uh, also come outside of this new regime. They are, have their own uh, insolvency rules. Um, and thirdly, small suppliers until the end of this month uh, will still be able to terminate even if their customers have gone into an, uh, a relevant insolvency procedure. Now, what is a small supplier? Uh, there are three tests of which the supplier needs to satisfy two. So if their turnover is no more than 10.2 million, balance sheet of no more than 5.1 million, and average employees uh, of no more than 50. But as I say, that only applies to the end of this month. But the last point I wanted to highlight was, uh, and it's, it's quite a key takeaway point, I think, is that even when a customer has gone into a relevant insolvency procedure, um, if it continues to breach the supply contract, possibly through non-payment, that breach is still actionable by the supplier. So if your contract allows you to do so, you can still terminate the contract because of that breach, rather than because of the fact of the insolvency procedure. So I think that's very much worth uh, bearing in mind. So the question then arises, what steps can you take to mitigate against the impact of these new rules? Well, first of all, I think uh, the need to keep very vigilant in monitoring the financial condition of your counterparties 
is only more important. Um, look out for telltale signs such as credit insurance withdrawal, uh, credit rating downgrades, uh, and any other sort of early warning uh, lights that come on uh, as regards the financial condition of your customers. And think about building into your contracts notification obligations to allow you to get that insight at an early stage. Secondly, uh, on termination rights, bring them earlier so that they apply and kick in before a relevant insolvency procedure is begun. Um, and that is something we're definitely seeing um, already developing into uh, long-term commercial supply contracts so that um, things like uh, intention to appoint administrators or balance sheet insolvency becomes the trigger to termination rather than the more formal processes that I mentioned earlier. And thirdly, um, keep in mind the need to take swift action whenever you think uh, your customer's financial condition is deteriorating so that you don't have to wait until it's too late and an insolvency procedure has begun. Uh, the other question that um, is asked and we've been asked in the context of this uh, session is what about the need for insolvency termination triggers at all? Are they worth even having anymore? And I think the answer to that is yes, they are. Uh, and the reason for that is it may be that you need a termination clause uh, still to be in the contract if you want to apply, for example, uh, on the grounds of undue hardship, as we discussed earlier, to a court to allow you to terminate the contract. And you've obviously got to have a right to terminate uh, to allow the court uh, to give an order for you to do so. So on that basis alone, worth keeping in the insolvency uh, procedure triggers. Uh, and that is consistent with uh, what we've seen in the US, that, as I explained earlier, has had this type of regime in place since the 1980s and they've still retained insolvency termination triggers. So finally, I wanted to, to bring this uh, alive and, and, and give it um, some real illustration with a case study, which is on this slide. Um, and as it's uh, Taco Tuesday, I thought it was only appropriate to have a taco based uh, case study. So let's imagine that um, Hipster Hygiene is supplying cleaning services and equipment to Top Tacos, which is a UK wide chain of taco restaurants. Um, Top Tacos experienced, like many restaurants, a resurgence in business during the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, uh, decided to extend that by self funding, but uh, has been late in paying the invoices to Hipster Hygiene since the beginning of the pandemic built up sizable arrears uh, and is now considering, now we're into September, closing some of its less profitable restaurants. And there has also been a press report around uh, it considering a CVA. The CFO of Hipster Hygiene comes to you and says, well, what action should we be taking um, as regards our contract with Top Tacos? Uh, and I think it's worth breaking that um, answer into two phases. So the first phase is, now before it's gone into any um, relevant insolvency procedure. First point is obviously to, to check the existing terms of the supply contract. You know, are there termination events that you can exercise now uh, for non-payment, uh, for material breach, for pre-insolvency procedure types of insolvent um, action or uh, considerations? Secondly, is there an is there opportunity now to um, improve your payment terms? Um, you know, should they be paid? Should you be being paid in advance or, or much quicker? Should there be other forms of comfort you're looking to introduce? You know, a parent company guarantee, for example, is that something that uh, you should be thinking about imposing uh, on uh, top tacos? Now, the one point in parent company guarantees, just to bear in mind, is there is um, a line of argument that actually parent company guarantees that apply once a counterparty, a customer has gone into an insolvency procedure are ineffective now because that entitles the supplier to do any other thing. Now, um, I think what that means is if you're going for a PCG, um, you should make sure that it kicks in earlier than any insolvency procedure being embarked upon. Let's then imagine that actually nothing gets done and then uh, Top Tacos actually does embark upon the insolvency procedure. Um, are you then exposed? Well, the first point, as I mentioned just now, is bear in mind that if there is an ongoing breach, for example, non-payment, you can still terminate the contract on the grounds of that non-payment if the contract allows you to do so. So aside from the insolvency procedure itself. Secondly, I guess the question is, well, is it worth uh, terminating um, 
is it worth keeping with top tacos and, and, and riding out the storm it's going through um, is another relevant consideration. Uh, I should have mentioned actually at the pre-insolvency procedure, I think um, one product of this new regime that could arise is that suppliers take a pretty aggressive approach when they think an insolvency procedure is likely to actually pull the rug on customers earlier and uh, take the wrath and the risk of being sued for a pudatory breach on the grounds that it may be that you know they feel the customer is, is not really that likely to have the wherewithal to defend themselves and to take a claim for a pudatory breach against the supplier. Pretty aggressive, but I think that may be a product of uh, these new changes in certain cases. So what are the key takeaways, uh, forgive the pun, uh, from uh, the new regime? Well, first of all, accelerate the application of your termination rights to earlier uh, than an insolvency procedure being embarked upon. Uh, secondly, I think that the need and importance to really get into, into some insight on your customer's financial condition uh, is only more important. And that's both before uh, the contract is entered into, but also building in protections and information type obligations during the contract so you can keep a good monitoring on financial condition. And thirdly, um, don't be afraid to build in where you can earlier and shorter payment terms and other forms of comfort in the form of parent company guarantees drafted so they don't apply only on the insolvency procedure as I earlier mentioned. But I think the upshot really all these roads lead to take a, taking quicker action whenever you feel a customer uh, is at risk of um, approaching an insolvency procedure. Thank you very much that finishes that section we'll now move on to uh, Rowan and COVID-19 and force majeure. Thanks for that, Richard. Now, as I'm sure most of you are aware, a force majeure clause typically operates to excuse a party to a contract from performing its contractual obligations due to an event or circumstance that is beyond that party's reasonable control. For obvious reasons, these clauses have received a lot of attention during the coronavirus crisis. And as that crisis is far from over, we thought it would be worth touching upon our experience advising clients on force majeure clauses during COVID-19. So on that basis, I'm going to cover five key questions. What if the force majeure clause doesn't refer to epidemics or outbreaks of illness? Prevent, hinder, delay or impede, what's the difference here? What else do I need to watch out for with a force majeure clause? What's the impact if lockdown measures are eased and then tightened up again? And lastly, what if I'm in a hole, I can't perform the contract, but the force majeure clause is unhelpful? Now, before delving into each question, there are a couple of basic points I want to make. Firstly, as most of you are aware, under English law, force majeure is a creature of contract, with there being no doctrine of force majeure. As a result, whether a particular clause will relieve a party from a contractual liability will depend on the precise wording used in the clause the allocation of risk between the parties provided in the contract as a whole, and the situation which has arisen. However, in the absence of a force majeure clause in a contract, a party would need to rely on other avenues to excuse its performance, such as the law of frustration, although this doctrine has limited application, or other contractual mechanisms agreed, for example, material adverse change clause, change in law clause, um, price review clause, if those have been agreed and would be triggered in the particular circumstances. The second point to make is that it is for the party that seeks to rely on the force majeure clause to satisfy a court that it is entitled to do so. Force majeure clauses are, however, construed narrowly against the party seeking to do so. And as I'll come on to explain, there are a number of potential hoops to jump through here. So let's take each question in turn. What if the force majeure clause doesn't refer to epidemics or outbreaks of illness? In this situation, you'll have to fall back on the general wording of the clause, which will usually refer to an event or circumstance which is beyond a party's reasonable control, often in conjunction with example force majeure events expressly listed in the wording of the clause. In such circumstances, provided the list of force majeure events is not an exhaustive definition and includes a catch-all provision, the clause the courts view these as giving a flavour of the type of events which the parties intended to be covered by the clause. So, for example, the courts have refused to accept that the last financial crisis was an event beyond a party's reasonable control, 
not so much because it was felt to be within the party's control, but more because it didn't fit with the other types of events mentioned in the clause, such as earthquake, fire, flood, and it was regarded as a risk that all businesses had to contend with. I mean, that said, our view is that COVID-19 stands a far better chance of being held to be in the same category as the type of event typically mentioned in a force majeure clause. So just because there's no express mention of epidemic or illness, that doesn't mean that the force majeure clause is not applicable. There may also be situations where a party can rely on other aspects of the clause as well. For example, if a government imposed restriction that is causing difficulties with performance rather than the epidemic itself is in place, you may be able to rely on an express reference to government action in a force majeure clause. But remember, that not all contracts contain that wording and some don't even give a general concept of events beyond a party's reasonable control. Um, in drafting and negotiating force majeure clauses, unsurprisingly, what we're now seeing is a far greater focus on what constitutes a force majeure event and its implications, which often expressly includes, or excludes as the case may be, reference to an epidemic or pandemic, or even more specifically, acknowledges that agreement has been entered into during the COVID-19 pandemic, and for example, addresses whether the force majeure clause is intended to capture COVID-19, or any future significant increases in infection rates, or new restrictions or measures which may be deployed. But let's say that the clause is capable of being triggered by events such as COVID-19. This doesn't necessarily mean that the force majeure clause actually applies though, because the clause will often require causation and specify a particular level of impact that the event in question must have in order for the clause to be activated. I mean, reference may be made, for example, to an event having prevented, hindered, delayed, or impeded performance. I mean, the choice of words here can be absolutely critical. Um, where a force majeure clause refers to performance as being prevented, it may be necessary to show that performance of the obligation is physically or legally impossible. And this sets obviously a very high bar. On the other hand, where language such as delay, hinder, or impede is used, you may be able to show um, that the force majeure clause has been triggered where performance is not impossible but has simply become a lot more difficult. But if the problem is essentially that performance has just become a lot more expensive, then even if you have this less demanding wording, it's likely to be an uphill struggle to show that the clause is triggered. Also, in some instances, to avoid this issue being raised, the force majeure clause may expressly cover this off. For example, a shortage of raw materials caused by a force majeure event may hinder the performance of a manufacturing contract if those materials can be obtained at a higher cost, but performance would mean breaking other contracts. However, the fact that performance would simply be less profitable due to the higher costs, for example, in sourcing alternative supplies of materials or labour, is generally unlikely to be sufficient to absolve the party as to its liability to perform. So what else do we need to look out for with force majeure clauses? Firstly, be aware of subclauses or provisos which cut down the scope of the force majeure clause. In a similar vein, it's worth mentioning that it's important to consider the wider context of an agreement. Um, so where COVID-19 or its adverse effects fall clearly within a particular category of risk which an agreement has allocated, any force majeure clause is unlikely to assist a party claiming relief for example, in contracts relating to venues or events, force majeure clauses or the wider contract will sometimes contain provisos stating that problems with transport to an event, including where caused by government action or epidemic or illness, are entirely at the customer's risk. So even though such problems might have been regarded as beyond a party's reasonable control, the subclause or wider context effectively pulls the rug out from under that. It's also essential to follow the notice provisions, otherwise the other party may be able to argue that the force majeure clause was never properly activated, even where it clearly applies. I mean, a key point to watch out here is timing. I mean, for example, if the government restricts certain activities, you would need to draft the notice to indicate that the force majeure clause was activated from the date those restrictions come into force not the date you first hear about them. If you activate sooner, you risk jumping the gun and acting in breach of contract. 
course, there's nothing to stop you sending your notice as soon as you know about the restrictions. It just needs to be drafted so as to make it clear that the notice only takes effect from the date the restrictions come into force. I mean, the key point here is really just not to mess up the notice because you're in a hurry. It's better to take your time and get it right. Another point to watch out for is that there may be a duty on the affected party, either expressly under the contract or implied by law, to mitigate the effects of force majeure as far as possible. For example, by taking reasonable steps to remedy or alleviate the effects. I mean, in such circumstances, the affected party may not be absolved of any losses that they could have avoided if they had complied with their duty to mitigate. Practically, it's important that you document all decisions and rationale, especially in the current times. Keeping relevant meeting minutes on file is a prudent and highly recommended step that I would advise. Um, this is particularly important at the moment as government guidance is changing frequent, frequently, um, which may mean that without a documented process, decisions taken one day may be seen as less reasonable in hindsight. And lastly, um, check the consequences of the force majeure clause being activated. The usual remedy, as most of you will know, is that a force majeure clause which is invoked will simply suspend a party's obligations and or liabilities under the contract and they'll be excused from those um, without any damages being payable. But force majeure clauses also sometimes provide for an extension of time or compensation to be payable. I mean, however, um, a, a key point here, which again you will know about, is that it's not uncommon for force majeure clause, clauses to have a bit of a sting in their tail from the perspective of suppliers, because they provide that if the force majeure event continues for a period of time, say 90 days, then the customer can terminate. Which brings me on to my next point. A rather unusual feature of the COVID-19 epidemic is that some businesses are having to contend with the possibility that lockdown measures get eased, allowing the contract to be performed, but then get tightened up again, perhaps due to a second wave. Now, obviously, at the point of easing, the force majeure clause may cease to be applicable, but if restrictions are tightened up again, then it may come back into play. As I've just explained, many force majeure clauses allow termination after a period such as 90 days. So in this scenario, when the clause has been reactivated, do you restart the clock or reset it to zero? So far as we're aware, there's no case law on this, but a common sense position might be that as the underlying force majeure event has remained the same, the clock should be suspended if performance becomes possible at, say, the 40-day point, but then restart it when measures are tightened up again, rather than re to reset to zero. However, there may be situations when the drafting of the clause or the contractual background makes a difference here. For example, if during the period when the lockdown was relaxed, a customer has managed to obtain all of the goods it needs from its supplier, then it may be able to argue that the parties must have intended that the clock be reset to zero. This would be on the basis that the 90 day period is designed to allow the customer to buy elsewhere only if it has not been able to secure the goods it needed from its suppliers within that 90 day period, which is clearly not the case in this example. But it's also worth noting that some force majeure termination rights apply only on an aggregate or they, they apply on an aggregated basis. That is the number of days any force majeure event subsists over the term of the agreement or a particular period rather than the termination right being tied to one particular or continuous force majeure event. If that was the case, the position would obviously be far clearer here. Um, the last point I want to cover off is what you can do if the force majeure clause isn't very helpfully drafted from your perspective and you can't rely on the clause, which is a situation we've come across for a num with a number of clients. Whilst, as I've mentioned, there may be other legal doctrines or contractual remedies or mechanisms which can be utilised, it is possible that a party may be required to adopt a more creative approach. Both government and senior figures in the, ju the judiciary have expressed concern that the strict common law approach to contractual interpretation and obligations could be counterproductive in exceptional circumstances such as those that we're in with COVID-19. For example, it may result in many other, otherwise perfectly viable businesses going under, particularly in cases where a force majeure clause or the lack of one is likely to produce 
quite a severe outcome, there are two places which you could turn for assistance. Firstly, the Cabinet Office has issued formal advice encouraging businesses to adopt a reasonable and proportionate response to requests for amended performance and to resolve, resolve disputes through negotiation rather than litigation. Although this is not binding, it is some, something that you can refer to in negotiations with customers or suppliers to make the case for not being held to the absolute letter of the contract given the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, that's very much a soft law point though. Um, for hard law arguments to bolster your negotiating position, it's worth looking at a recent concept paper authored by, amongst others, two former Supreme Court judges. We've done a more detailed briefing on this, but just to give you a flavour of what it contains, one of their suggestions is to rely on the concept of relational contracts. This is a relatively recent development in English law, but it does seem to be gaining more widespread acceptance. I mean, there's no definitive test for a relational contract, but the courts have indicated that it will generally involve a longer term relationship, a substantial degree of commitment from both parties, and a high degree of communication and cooperation between the parties. For example, for example this would probably capture joint ventures, complex outsourcing, and distribution of franchising arrangements. The key point to note here is that relational contracts can sometimes be interpreted less strictly than other types of contracts. In particular, greater weight can be accorded to the overall purpose of the contract and in some cases an obligation to act in good faith may be implied. This difference in approach as compared with other types of contracts may help you to argue for an interpretation that avoids what would otherwise be an adverse outcome. Now we're not stating, saying this this will help in all cases. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's mainly of relevance where strict compliance with the contract and the exceptional circumstances of the COVID-19 epidemic would produce a particularly harsh outcome for one party. But we think that some of these avenues are definitely worth exploring, especially where the literal wording of the contract seems to favour one side, us uh, favour the other side, sorry, and you're looking to persuade them to look for a negotiated solution. Um, finally, before I finish, I just wanted to mention um, our free COVID-19 force majeure app, which was developed by our in-house legal team. And this will help where you've got a large number of contracts and need to prioritise those requiring a view. So for example, the app's been developed that will spot um, whether a particular contract has a force majeure clause and whether there are termination rights linked to them, and also which ones specifically refer to epidemics or illness and are more likely to be triggered by COVID-19. I mean, if you'd like more details around that, please contact one of us after the webinar. But now I'll hand over to Ben to take us through Brexit and the contractual points to look out for. Thank you very much, Ren. So um, like a bad dinner party, we're going to move from COVID-19 onto Brexit. Um, and this is going to be a bit of a smorgasbord of, of different contractual issues uh, associated with Brexit. A lot of which um, those of you that have attended previous uh, webinars and other briefings that we've given on the subject of Brexit will be familiar with. But I make no apology for reiterating these points again, because obviously the situation we're in at the moment is we have around about three and a half months to go until the end of the transition period. Uh, clearly, the negotiations between uh, the EU and the UK are not going particularly well. Uh, all the mood music suggests that if we get a deal at all, um, it's going to not look a million miles different from uh, a no-deal Brexit. And so really now is the time, to the extent that you haven't done already, that um, Brexit issues come into uh, sharp focus. So um, first up, I want to talk about Brexit in the context of force majeure, uh, material adverse change. And obviously, Rowan has talked about force majeure in some detail and I don't, I don't want to repeat the points that he has made. However, I did just want to touch on force majeure in the context of Brexit and this is because it's obviously reasonable to assume that Brexit, particularly a no-deal Brexit, um, is inevitably going to make performance contracts more challenging for some parties and it's also reasonable to assume I think that these parties will be uh, looking to the terms of their contracts to see if they offer any relief from performance. Uh, with force majeure clause obviously being a you know the obvious place to start. Now, um, as we know, force majeure clause is aimed to cover off the potential events that could prevent uh, or frustrate a party from performing its obligations through no fault of its own. 
Um, and it's for this reason that the court's approach to the doctrine of frustration, which Rowan mentioned briefly, uh, gives us some pointers on how they're going to view uh, reliance on force majeure provisions in the context of Brexit. Um, and this brings us on to the uh, Canary Wharf and European Medicines Agency case from last year, uh, with which many of you will, I'm sure, be familiar. In a nutshell, as a reminder, the background to this case was that the EMA had entered into a 25-year lease with Canary Wharf in 2014. And following the outcome of the uh, Brexit referendum in 2016, the EMA felt that it had no choice but to relocate to Amsterdam. Canary Wharf then sought a High Court declaration that the lease was not frustrated by Brexit. Now, um, as a reminder, frustration requires there to be uh, an event that renders the contract physically or commercially impossible to fulfil, such that both parties should be released from their obligations. The frustrating event has to be fundamental to the contract and beyond the contemplation of the parties when the contract was entered into. Uh, it also has to make performance of the contract impossible, illegal, or materially different from the original agreement. Importantly, just to pick up again on a point that Rome was making, it's not sufficient that the contract has just become more costly uh, or more inconvenient to perform. So in this case, even though uh, the EMA could show that it had no choice but to relocate uh, as a result of Brexit, because the UK's departure from the EU effectively made performing the lease uh, ultra virus for the EMA. That's because the EMA doesn't have capacity under EU law to hold or deal with a movable property outside the EU. Um, the court still found in Canary Wharf's favour. Essentially, the court said that EU law was relevant to the capacity of the EMA to enter into the lease, but not to the question of whether illegality had caused the lease to be frustrated. Even if the EMA lacked the capacity to continue performance of the lease under EU law, this was effectively irrelevant for the purposes of the English law of frustration. So what does this case tell us about how the courts might approach cases involving force majeure claims uh, as a result of Brexit? Well, clearly it shows that the courts remain reluctant to allow frustration to be invoked, uh, and it's going to remain a doctrine of pretty narrow application. Anyone trying to claim a contract is frustrated as a result of Brexit is therefore inevitably facing an uphill battle. And I think by analogy, this suggests that the courts will also construe force majeure clauses narrowly when it comes to Brexit, which perhaps isn't that surprising. Uh, particularly if you see the cases that came out of the last financial crisis that, that Rome mentioned. But what, what this probably also means is that standard force majeure definitions, you know, any circumstance beyond the reasonable control of the effective party, including, etc., are unlikely to capture Brexit per se. That's not to say that you can't tailor your force majeure clause to try and capture issues that might be caused by Brexit, um, but such wording is still going to be interpreted narrowly but a more bespoke clause that covers events clearly that have Brexit in mind, like third party supply chain difficulties, for example, probably stands a better chance of holding up. Uh, one other notable aspect of the EMA case was that Brexit was found to have had a material adverse effect on the EMA. So whilst this wasn't enough to frustrate the lease, it does suggest that a well-drafted MAC clause might be a better way for contractual parties to seek to mitigate their risks as a result of Brexit. Um, and it's probably fair to say that certainly in the immediate aftermath of the referendum and for the next 12 to 18 months afterwards, we did start to see uh, some of these clauses creeping into agreements. But perhaps because um, COVID issues have sort of overtaken, um, they seem to have died away somewhat, but they are still worth bearing in mind. But there are some important points that you need to consider. Uh, it's fair to say that MAC clauses aren't a common feature of commercial contracts, um, but uh, where, where you are including them, you do you do need to be pretty careful about the drafting. The Decura uh, and UBS case on the slide really highlights this. So just briefly, the background to this case was as follows. Decura had an agreement with UBS. Uh, the agreement included a number of termination events. One of these allowed Decura to terminate if UBS uh, firstly ceased to carry on a material part of its investment banking business. And secondly, that cessation had a material adverse effect on its ability to market the products and services. Now in 2012, UBS announced a strategy which was known as Project Accelerate, which involved exiting businesses that delivered unattractive returns, particularly within its fixed income, currencies and commodities operations. Uh, Decura later sought to terminate, claiming that as a result of Project Accelerate, UBS had ceased to carry on a material part of its investment banking business, and this had a material adverse effect. 
Um, and then this was disputed and Dakura then sought a declaration that it was entitled to terminate the agreement. Now, Dakura was unable to prove that Project Accelerate had a material adverse effect and it lost the case. And the case really highlights the importance of being uh, as specific as you can be about the meaning of material adverse effect. So, for example, does it mean cost increases, delays, uh, loss of authorizations, or, or something else? And the materiality test is going to be a high bar. So, the more specific you can be about it, the better. Um, in the context of Brexit, given its complexity and all the potential permutations, this is, I think, all the more important and potentially all the more challenging as well. Um, so let's just move on to uh, the next slide, good shortages. How, how can contracts help? And I just want to encourage you to think creatively about how you could potentially use contracts as a way of hedging against Brexit-related risks, uh, such as good shortages, i.e. as an alternative to or in addition to other, other uh, Brexit mitigation measures that you may be taking, like stockpiling. Uh, particularly if we are, um, as seems ever more likely, looking at a no-deal Brexit. Um, so first up, I think it's worth thinking about priority supply obligations, so you don't find yourself at the bottom of the packing order if there's a shortage of the goods that you need. Uh, you might have to commit to paying a higher price, but the arrangement could be structured so that you only pay this higher price if you need to call upon it, i.e. more in the nature of an option. Um, one particular word of warning here, I think, is relying on terms such as preferred customer. When left undefined, uh, terms like these are unlikely to prove as beneficial as you might have hoped. The analogy here is with the more common term preferred supplier. Uh, there was a case in 2007 which looked at the meaning of this term, uh, Pro Force Recruit Limited and Rugby Group Limited, and it found that it meant little more than that the preferred supplier was effectively just one of a number of approved suppliers. It certainly didn't give us any sort of higher preferential status. Uh, there may also be scope for uh, mutually beneficial option deals uh, with UK suppliers which currently export most of their production to the EU if they can't reach their customers in the EU because of, for example, delays at the channel ports. They might have, be happy to have an option to sell to you instead and again you may be able to structure this so that you only pay for those goods if you actually need them. Now, as with any option, if you are going down this road, it's crucial to think carefully about the drafting and define the parameters of the option clearly. Uh, volumes, timescales for exercise, stockholding obligations on the supplier pending exercise, and the strike price are all likely to be important considerations. Ideally, you'll want an obligation on the supplier to notify you when the goods are available for purchase and for that offer to remain open for a clearly defined period of time during which others cannot purchase the goods. And you'll also want a clear procedure for accepting the offer, or if you have to make an offer to buy, then a clear procedure and timetable for the seller to accept and clear criteria for when it can reject your offer. Also a quick flag uh, just to watch out for here where you plan to have an option that's effectively a, a, an opportunity to match the best offer that the supplier has received from elsewhere. You might be familiar with the disputes that arose between uh, Liverpool Football Club and Rangers against New Balance and Sports Direct, respectively, uh, over matching rights that applied to the termination of kit deals that those football clubs had with those suppliers. Uh, these sort of highlighted the need to specify clearly what matching means and also potentially think about competition law issues in that context. Finally, uh, and this this isn't just specific to the contracts for the supply of goods, and it touches on a point that, that Richard made earlier on in the, in the session. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the importance of information and audit rights here, particularly where you might have concerns that your counterparty could face financial difficulties as a result of Brexit. These rights, which can uh, require the counterparty to provide regular financial information and to submit to financial covenant tests, as well as audit rights, uh, can be an effective way of flagging up potential issues early on. Uh, and with businesses already struggling to deal with COVID-19 and facing the double whammy of Brexit, these clauses I think are likely to take on enhanced importance uh, in the near to mid term. So um, finally, I just want to deal with the issue of Brexit and INCO terms. Um, INCO terms, as I'm sure you know, are widely used uh, abbreviated terms drawn up by the International Chamber of Commerce that define a transaction between an importer and an exporter so that the parties have clarity on their respective responsibilities for the tasks, risks and uh, responsibilities associated with the delivery and receipt of products. Uh, in particular, they stipulate which party has the obligation to arrange transport, uh, known as carriage, uh, 
and insurance of the goods, uh, which party will be responsible for the costs of transport, insurance and customs duties, and at what point uh, delivery is deemed to take place and risk, but not title, uh, passes to the customer. Uh, the INCO terms are designed to cover off all the possible ways of dividing responsibilities and obligations for those things between the two parties. So currently, uh, a business importing goods from the EU will obviously not have to worry about paying customs duties because the UK remains part of the customs union uh, until the end of the transition period. But in a no-deal Brexit scenario, tariffs are likely to be payable. Liability to pay tariffs often uh, rest with the customer, not the supplier. So unless the customer uh, contracts to have goods supplied on DDP or delivery duty paid terms or similar, uh, it's likely to be responsible for paying any tariffs imposed by the UK authorities, as well as carrying out any relevant customs formalities so that the goods are cleared for import. Um, Brexit could also make uh, a difference to obligations to arrange transport. For example, goods passing through the channel ports or the channel tunnel uh, may be subject to significant delays because of increased border checks. Uh, whilst the Inca terms do not stipulate the time for delivery, the party responsible for transport will usually be expected to deliver within a reasonable time, and Brexit may make uh, any such contractual uh, commitments more difficult to meet. Transport costs could also increase. Um, for example, we might see the need to pay HGV drivers more per trip because of longer journey times, or the need to use different routes to avoid pinch points like the channel ports. Um, just to flag that this isn't just a sort of esoteric issue, this is a massive issue for some businesses, particularly the big grocers and their suppliers. There was an article a couple of weeks ago in the Grocer magazine that referred to this as the biggest single risk to the, to the UK food chain, with new customs declarations for EU trade estimated as, a likely, as likely to cost British businesses up to about £7 billion a year, and the prospect of average tariffs of 20% uh, on food and drink unless a zero tariff deal is reached. Now the issue for suppliers is that most food arriving at UK supermarkets is actually currently supplied on, on DDP terms, meaning that the supplier is primarily responsible for the import process and any associated costs. This obviously hasn't been an issue for EU imports while the UK has been part of the single market in the customs union, but now um, is set to become a kind of key battleground, particularly as a number of the supermarket chains have already come out and made it clear that they are going to hold their suppliers to DDP terms. So if you're in a position where you have contracts based on INCA terms and you haven't already looked at these and considered carefully the implications of Brexit, I would, I would recommend that you do so uh, as a matter of priority. And finally, I did just want to mention one specific point on this, uh, which in a sense slightly goes against some of the earlier points I've been uh, making, but it, but it shows how um, important it is to be on your guard about INCO terms related issues. Um, so for the same reasons I already mentioned, if you're a UK exporter to the EU, you are now uh, likely to want to supply your products on, on an XWorks or EXW basis or, or something similar to avoid liability for import duties and other costs. However, this uh, could be a problem where the customer organises pickup from your premises because you won't then necessarily have proof that the goods have left the UK. Uh, this could then mean that HMRC comes after you for UK VAT, from which exports would otherwise normally be exempt. So the solution to this is to agree with the customer that they will provide you with proof of export or opt for another INCO term like FCA, where you would effectively deliver the goods to the customer's shipper. I think the sort of more general point here is um, that although INCO terms are standardised and, and quite helpful in terms of providing a sort of abbreviated uh, set of terms that will apply to the contract, they do only cover certain aspects of the arrangements and don't prevent you from adding supplementary obligations if you need to, like, for example, here, a requirement to provide proof of exports. Um, so those were all the points I wanted to make on Brexit. Um, if any of you do have any questions coming out of the session, uh, do feel free to get in touch. Our details are there on the slide. And do please uh, check out our website where you can find briefings and other materials on a lot of the issues we've discussed and on others. Thanks very much for listening.